Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Karina Robinson, co-director of the Inclusion Initiative with my colleague, Professor Grace Lorden. This new research center at the LSE brings together behavioral science and data to create more inclusive corporate cultures. We're currently working on a number of fantastic projects, which range from how artificial intelligence can promote inclusion in the workplace, to how luck versus effort is attributed across groups. Do follow us on Twitter at LSE underscore TII or sign up to our newsletter. Directions on how to do that should be in the chat box. This event will be recorded and after 40 minutes, we'll open up to questions from the floor. And please put them in the chat box. Now, this is the ninth of our Open Door Open City monthly webinars. The name speaks for itself. We aim to open the door to the city and the business, to all talent, and to make sure they're included. That is how you create a culture of innovation, of openness, of productivity. Now, we're immensely lucky to have with us today Esther Odejimi Uzokwe. A big welcome to Open Door, Open City, Esther. Thank you, Karina. Thanks for having me on. Esther is the Managing Director of 10,000 Black Interns. She was an equity derivatives at Goldman Sachs. She studied religion and theology at Oxford. She starred in an incredible performance as Lady Macbeth, founded a not-for-profit called Open Palm, and sits on the board of Intermission Theatre. That's a Renaissance woman, if ever one's met one. Now, we'll be talking about all of this, but Esther, I'd like to start with 10,000 Black Interns. For many of our audience, they don't know what it is. What is it? Yeah, so in short, and I'm happy to kind of go into details as well if, if people are interested, but 10,000 Black Interns is a very new organization. We launched last year in the summer and we actually started off as 100 Black Interns. And I know that there's a massive difference between 100 and 10,000, so I can go into how we kind of morph from one to the other. But in short, we exist to increase the participation of Black people across industry, um, receiving paid work, paid internship opportunities, and hopefully that translating into a much more inclusive and diverse workforce across the 24 different sectors that we are partnered with. And I'd like, definitely like more, uh, more info about how you go from 100 to 10,000. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have a fantastic board of co-founders. Um, one of them last summer wanted to, and sorry, I should mention that three out of four of them actually have had very long standing careers in finance and investment management. And one of the co-founders last summer actually wanted to host a dinner for black investment managers in the city of London. And he quickly realized that out of maybe two to 3,000 of these portfolio managers in the city, if you're lucky, up to 15 of them are black people. And this coincided with the murder of George Floyd, of course. And, you know, the time was right, I think, across industry, across academia, to do something tangible about this underrepresentation. You know, enough roundtables, enough discussions. We know that the problem exists. Let's actually do something that will pay us positive dividends in industry. And that's where the idea of 100 Black Interns actually came about. That's where it was born. And initially in its inception, it was focused purely in investment management. And the idea was to get 100 investment management firms to sign up to this program. And what they're essentially signing up to is to offer one internship, one paid internship to a black student who is studying at any UK university in a front office, revenue generating, client facing, investment management team because one of the other nuances of black participation in industry is that we know that you know if we are represented we're often represented in back office or middle office roles um, so it was a very simple premise and the only prerequisite from the firm perspective was to hire at least one intern pay at least the local living wage um, in London and for it to last at least six weeks um, so, so you know tangible experience that they can use to leverage uh, further on in their career so that's where we started and you know the the co-founders came together and started calling firms up um firms that they knew firms that they had in their contact list and within 24 hours they had more than 100 investment management firms saying yep yeah, we're all game we're, we want to do this so they doubled the intake they signed up 200 investment management firms put about 40 to 50 on a waiting list and then um decided to open up applications to students so at the point in at that point in time i don't know if you know any of the listeners uh, caught on to it at the time but it was essentially a hashtag circulating on social media and LinkedIn called hashtag 100 black interns opened up applications to students expecting to get two to 300 ended up getting two and a half thousand applications from black students studying across the UK 2165 of them being illegible applications so 
as we expect in every single year, we had some cheeky people trying their luck with the eligibility criteria. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just blew the expectation out of the water and there are a number of key indicators of success. So 200 firms signed up instead of 100. Each firm said they'll take on one intern each. We have at this point in time, about 500 interns about to take up their positions in, in industry this year. Um, also, there's an organization called GAIN, Girls Are Investors, and they did some research recently in investment management. And they found that around about 20% of the usual graduate intake are people who identify as female. And of course, the other 80% are those who identify as male. So it's a very white and male and quite elite um, industry. And cut a long story short, off of the first year, um, kind of taking stock of where we are now, we had applications from 41, well, 41% 41 of those that applied identify as female. And that translated into 45%. Years. Yeah, and it, I, I, it translated into 45% of the offer rate. So, you know, where it's not 50 or more, which is where we would love it to be, it's more than double what we're classically seeing in investment management. 59% um, of the applications came from non-Russell Group University students and that translated into 40% of the offer rate. So again, for us, we would love that to be more, but it's, it's fantastic. I'll, I'll pay big money to see an investment management firm that has 40% of their workforce coming from non-Russell Group universities and 45% of them being female. Um, so yeah, and other industries looked onto this and said, you know, we are just as bad or if not worse as investment management, we need this too. And that's how we turned from 100 black interns into 10,000 black interns. And now we're open to every sector. We're partnered up with 24 um, and the idea of 10,000 black interns is that it starts in 2022 in terms of internship delivery and we have a target of 2,000 internships a year. Um, so in terms of reaching that target for next year, we've done that already. We're partnered up with more than 750 firms across the UK um, and Ireland, should I say. And also um, together they've, they've pledged more than 2,000 internships towards the programme. So that's how we turned from 100 to 10,000 and uh, let's see where it goes. <laughs> I think the sky's the limit if you've already had such an incredible take up, both from students and from the firms. I mean, that just shows you what pent up demand there is. And also that, you know, the firms have realized that something needs to be done. I mean, and interestingly, you know, I was looking at some of the statistics around and I'm talking more about the city, if you will, but black employees held a lower share of top US financial services jobs now than they did more than a decade earlier, according to the FT. So a lower share, and this is, so this is Wall Street, but it could as well be the city. And the newspaper then says, quote, underlining the shortcomings of Wall Street's long running efforts to improve racial diversity. Why haven't things changed? Is it unconscious bias? Is it a lack of um, opportunity, a lack of aspiration? What's your view, Esther? I think it's a number of things. It's an amalgamation of everything that you've just mentioned. And I think you're always going to, as a society, you're always going to land yourself in trouble if you do not acknowledge what the issues are. And my parents raised myself and my siblings with a very very kind of uh, poignant phrase that sticks with me. They said, when someone with a problem identifies that they have a problem, that's the first sign of healing from that problem. They always used to say that to us growing up. You have to be self-aware. You have to understand that there's an issue, where the issue is. And that is the first step to the entire healing process because at least you know and you have acknowledged. And I think we find this still happens a lot in society, within corporations, that there is a lot of gaslighting about the problem that exists or the, the extent to which the problem exists. You know, Overt racism is still a thing. Covert racism is still a thing. Institutional racism is still a thing. Of course, these things still exist, right? Um, and yeah, it's just extremely nuanced. I think as well as a black community, if you look at the kind of professions that we are pushed into, like I remember being I have two older brothers and we all went to the same primary school. We all went to the same secondary school. I remember being in secondary school and just seeing the types of careers that staff tried to push my brothers in particular into. I'd be very interested to see the stats about the participation in the industry of black men um, and in particular black Caribbean men, because we know that, you know, there is a very acute issue um, within that nuance of the community. But I remember, you know, just observing how they were told in very subtle ways, oh, have you considered 
a career in the NBA, like basketball, you're really tall, you're strong, you can jump really high. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, have you considered rap? You know, these kind of things. Yeah. And it just beggars belief, doesn't it? You just think these things come from, they stem from the ground up. It stems from the educational system. It stems from opportunities that are provided post-graduation from university, from the kind of connections that we have within the community. Um, Because it it, sometimes it takes to see yourself in a particular situation to also want to participate in that same space, right? And if you can't see yourself there, I mean, there are people who kind of have that tenacity and they don't care the state of where it is they want to head to. They just want to get there and their tunnel vision. And that's fantastic. But there are also many people who don't necessarily have that. and, And they need to see, they need that reassurance that they are already visible within that space. A, n- a number of issues. We could be here all day, Karina, discussing it. But, um, but yeah, and, you know, when I talk to two people in the city, they say it's changed. It's changed a lot. Mm. Now, you know, you've been in the city. You were at a number of institutions in the city before taking on this new role. Um, what was your experience? My experience in the city. It really was a baptism of fire because I was not. I, I just wasn't used to anything to do with life in the city, if that makes sense. I was born in, in, in Hackney, raised in Chadwell Heath, in a, on a very black street. Uh, most of my friends are black, if you know what I mean. And it's not, again, it's, I'm not pointing in the direction that the city is not the place for black people or black people are not in the city. However, the systems that I navigated through from the very beginning of my education through to even university didn't necessarily prep me for those kinds of experiences, for the kinds of experiences that I had within the city and the kind of cultures that are prevalent within the city as well. There are many unwritten rules in the city that if you don't know particular people or you haven't, for example, interned in particular spaces, which I didn't, I didn't intern in some of the spaces that I ended up uh, seeking employment within. So I didn't kind of have that prerequisite knowledge of, you know, this is how to do things and, and all of the above. But yeah, my experience in the city was, was good in the sense that it, it really, it strengthened me up where I was weak because you mentioned I was in an equity derivatives team, for example, within an investment bank. And I don't class myself for, um, as a technical person. Um, I ended up in the most technical team in one of the biggest investment banks in the world. And that really was good for me in terms of developing my weaknesses and becoming much more of an all-rounded person. And that my position in that firm is still paying dividends right now in terms of my role here, because as you said, I'm leading a team of, of an entire company and those skills have become extremely useful. The, the technical skills have become extremely useful in this role. Um, but yeah, I think the best way to describe my experience in the city is definitely a baptism of fire um, from all angles, from a cultural perspective, from an expectation perspective. Um, I definitely feel as though actually my time at, at university at Oxford did prep me a little bit just for how white the city is. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I feel like that was almost um, a training ground for some of the experiences that I would then go on to have. But did you have any experiences of outright racism or was it all very subtle? So I would definitely say during university, for example, I definitely experienced outright racism in that space. I remember in Freshers' Week, I had somebody, uh, you know, outright just use the N-word, um, put their arm around me and use the N-word, think, thinking it was a kind of term of com- camaraderie or something, well, that's how I would receive it. But of course, that's never how it's going to be received. So yeah, there, there were definitely examples of outright racism navigating that space. Um, I mean, I I can definitely recall a number of instances throughout the years that I spent um, at university, for example, kind of navigating over covert microaggressions, racism, and just very ignorant um, conversations. Now, this, um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned the idea of having a role model. Mm. which is very important for, for all of us. And Tommy Lube is a black tech entrepreneur who's, who's been on the program, amazing man. He's also on a number of other boards. He has very strong views that culture comes first and diversity follows. So the values in his firm, which are four, are flexibility, learning, openness, responsibility. Mm. And obviously it helps the diversity of his firm and the inclusion that he's a black role model. 
But what is your view of how to create an inclusive culture? Does diversity come first? How does one make it happen? I definitely think that I agree. I agree with the statement that culture comes first because inevitably that's what draws people in. Culture is what people observe or can observe. It's actually observ observable from the outside in. You can speak to employees. You can look at how the firm positions themselves with regards to particular um, you know, issues that are going on within the world, statements that they put out, all of the above. These things are little windows into what the culture within the firm may look like. And inevitably, and particularly in this world where everything is digital, everything is on social media, everything is accessible, I can say I'm interested in X firm right now, go on Google, find a statement that they put out with regards to a global event and say, absolutely not. I don't want to work for a firm that has that position. So the internal culture is so, so important because that is the kind of first exposure that you have to the firm from the outside looking in. In terms of diversity, once you actually get there, you then realize, okay, maybe there's no one that looks like me, let's change this. Or there are many people that look like me, that's fantastic, I feel like this is a safe space. So I definitely agree with the statement that culture comes first and diversity comes after. Um, but in terms of the conversation about diversity and inclusion, you cannot maintain one without the other. When it comes to diversity, it's fantastic. And you know, a number of firms probably face this issue where at the graduate level, they don't really have a problem hiring diverse talent, but they definitely have a problem retaining that talent and they now have to ask themselves those difficult questions. Why don't diverse candidates want to stay? What is it that is driving black talent away? A lot of them also have issues with lateral hires. They can't find people within industry above the associate level, if we're looking at finance, for example, who are you know, willing and able to navigate into their firm. And these are real issues that people, that companies, face and I think you know those difficult questions need to be had about the inclusiveness of their culture because it's not enough to just focus on diversity and say oh fantastic we've had you know 10% of our intake come from black or black African or Caribbean heritage when once they get there they're going to be in need of therapy and all sorts of intervention to be able to maintain a career there in the first place yeah um, so that, that's my view. At the um, inclusion initiative mm. we use behavioral science to create change and you know our big campaign is to create cultures of inclusion in offices. A lot of the financial services firms don't actually know how to do that. Mm. Uh, and we were looking at you know a basic thing like meetings, how you run meetings, mm. uh, you know, making sure you listen to all the ideas, everybody at that table, and not just the loudest, most confident voice. So you have to go down to the nitty gritty. But it's very difficult to do that. I mean, have you ever worked in an inclusive culture? Yeah, right now. Right now, I'm definitely working in a very, very inclusive culture. But um, that's because you're creating it, Esther. Oh, I, I guess partially. But then at the same time, I, I work for a fantastic board of people. And because we're a super lean team, they're very involved in, in the day-to-day -day work, actually, that, that's being done within the firm. And of course, I came into something that was already running to a certain point, right? And I came into a particular culture that was already set up in a particular way. And I definitely feel as though right now, I'm in a very, very inclusive space whereby it's very egalitarian. Everybody's view is an important view. Um, every take, every perspective is listened to. And there's no pecking order in the sense that, you know, this person has a superior view to the other, or we should veto particular decisions based on one or the other person's view. I think it's a very, very inclusive workspace, both um, racially, um, intellectually, um, you know, all of the above, even, you know, we're fully remote and that's another form of inclusion as well. It's very, very helpful to myself and the others who work for the company, just the, the flexibility of the working conditions. So yeah. that's becoming a big issue in the city mm. and Wall Street now because a number of firms have been very open to that idea and going forward and figuring out, well, we need people in the office, maybe it's two days a week with their team to, to get the brainstorming, the rest of it, and the rest of the time, or wherever possible, they can work in whichever way they like. Mm. But then you have the Goldman Sachs, um, I think it's JP Morgan, who are insisting that everybody needs to come into the office mm. all the time. And what's interesting about that, I think, is that the talent you attract, going back to what you were saying about culture, you know about firms' culture because it's all out there mm. now. 
there is a battle for talent. And a lot of people don't like being told exactly what to do in that way. And I think going forward, what we're going to see is that those sort of firms will not already, by the way, they don't, you know, when I was growing up, those firms got the cream of the bunch mm. and th they started losing out then to the Googles, to the startups, then to being just being an entrepreneur. And then to the fact that their peers were saying, what, you work at I don't know, Morgan Stanley? Well, good for you, but what's the big deal? Mm. Where before it wasn't like that. Do you think they will lose out even more, the firms that insist on running things in what I'd call an old-fashioned way? I'm, I'm not sure. I That's something that I think we should all keep our, our eyes on over the course of the next few years. Because one thing I know is that people don't like change. Companies don't like change. Societies don't like change. And we're in a situation where change really has been forced upon us as not even just a, you know, a country, the world, where, you know, change really has been forced upon the world. And different companies, you know, they have every right to respond to that in any way they so wish, but let's see what the, the results of that will be in the, in the coming months and years, you know? Um, it's an interesting one. I think let's 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 watch this space and, and see what happens. But I definitely what I do know is that there will still be people who are, you know, very willing to still take up positions in companies that, you know, have more stringent approaches to things like remote working. Um, but yeah, let, let's see what that looks like in the next five to 10 years. We first met when rather than being a managing director, um, you were Lady Macbeth in a jaw-dropping performance of Shakespeare's play set in a prison. It was intermission theatre. I mean, is there a bit of Lady Macbeth in you? And would you tell us a bit about intermission theatre? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with your second question. So intermission theatre. <laughs> You're not evading the first one. Oh, okay. no, no, I'll come to it. I'll come to it. But um, no, intermission theatre honestly has a piece of my, my heart, if not my soul. Um, I joined intermission whilst I was still doing my A-levels. I was in the first year of my A-levels, 17 years old. Um, and it was life-changing for me, absolutely life-changing. So to give the listeners a bit more context, intermission works with young people who are at risk of, or have a history of offending. Um, and it just so happens that the demographic is, you know, very, very, uh, it's filled with ethnic minorities. We know that there's a correlation between these things for whatever reason. It's definitely another nuanced issue <laughs> worth discussing. But um, intermission basically uses the transformative power of the arts and by God, they use it extremely effectively. I was part of their cohort for only a year before I ended up going off to university to study theology and religion. And as you said, I played Lady Macbeth in HMP Macbeth. That was the name of the production. And it was absolutely life-changing, absolutely life-changing. It really built my confidence just being on stage and performing. And to answer your question about are there elements of Lady Macbeth within me? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's the, it's her ability to influence, I think, in a much less sinister way, of course. I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't. Um, You're not uh, suggesting murder. Oh, no, 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 not suggesting that, not suggesting witchcraft or any of those things. But what I will definitely say is that, um, you know, just my time spent in the arts and really did boost my confidence and also stakeholder management, because being on set, you'll be very surprised how collaborative that kind of thing actually is. Um, there are so many different people, and these are characters, true characters that you are having to deal with and navigate around and be aware of. And I think in terms of my emotional intelligence and, you know, just my, my awareness of, the subtle changes in people's body language and things like that. It really has translated very well, I think, in terms of how I've been able to navigate in my career. Um, so well, yeah. One, one of the things, I mean, we've, we've recently interviewed um, Shelley Archambault, who's a Silicon Valley black tech entrepreneur, incredibly successful. And she wrote a book now that she's reached her 60s with all the sort of advice for younger women and younger people in general, but she called it unapologetically ambitious. Mm. And she talked about that and the reason is, and this ties in obviously with Lady Macbeth and ambition, mm. women 
And the word ambition is still seen as not quite right, really. It's not a pretty word, pretty being the operative word there. Um, and as a result, I think this sort of ties into some, to a research project that one of our PhD students, Erica Brodnock, has been working on. And the study showed that black women are the least likely to be in the top 1% of earners in the UK compared to any other group. Mm. This is partly that gender thing, isn't it? Mm, mm. That's a really interesting statistic. Yeah, yeah. I think there are probably elements of, definitely elements of the gender disparity, but also cultural elements come to mind as well. Because black culture, I'll speak of African culture because that, that pertains to me. I'm Nigerian by heritage. And I know that our culture is very much so that, well, one, we're very religious, um, you know, Islam and Christianity tend to dominate in, in Nigeria, for example. And I know that within my culture, the woman's place really is, you know, in the home, rearing the children and things like that. And as you said, things like being an ambitious woman can often be viewed as, you know, you're quite rebellious or, you know, what's wrong with you? You're trying to break the mold. You've got kids at home to raise or you should be thinking about having kids. You're how old and you're not pregnant yet? What's going on there? You know, all of that, all of that type of thing. So I think it's interesting that black women, as you say, you said are the least likely to be in the top 1% of earners. It's probably a lot of play there. I definitely do not wish to be on the wrong side of that statistic. I'm very ambitious. I, I acknowledge that, you know, sometimes, or for some people, a woman talking about money can also be seen as quite a dirty conversation. Like why, why are you bringing that up? People aren't used to the idea of an ambitious woman wanting to be a high earner, wanting to be successful, being competitive, you're almost seen as a threat or aggressive. We have that angry black woman trope that's often thrown at, at us when we kind of exhibit these kinds of qualities. The kind of qualities that if our white male counterparts exhibited, they'll be at the very top of the food chain. In fact, they don't even have to exhibit these, these kind of things and they're at the very top of the food chain in, in many instances. But um, it's an interesting one. I do feel as though culturally there are some barriers to, to black women earning a lot of money. Sure. The, um, going back to your Oxford days, religion and theology. Now this is something that maybe I shouldn't even ask you about because it's really not about the inclusion, but what's the difference between religion and theology? Uh, that's a good question. And I'm trying to remember everything I learned in my degree that I've never used since, but um, so yeah, the, I think the kind of roundabout definition is theology is considered the study of God. And in order to be religious, you don't have to believe in God. There are religions, for example, that you know, don't include a deity or have the worship of self, for example. So it's kind of the amalgamation of those two things as well as bringing in the social sciences and how it kind of interrelates with our day-to-day -day lives, really. Um, I think it's much less biblical as people probably think it is in terms of the study. I think when people hear theology and religion, religion, they think you're reading a Bible for three years, but actually not the case at all. I spent most of my time diving deep into psychology, sociology, anthropology, and it was a very, very broad course, which has since changed since I, um, since I studied it. it. Makes me feel old, but it wasn't that long ago. But um, yeah, very, very interesting degree course. I loved it. Do you think Oxford, being able to say I'm an Oxford graduate, has been a great help, a small help, no help at all in your career? I think it has been a help. I definitely feel as though, like what I would love to do is quench the idea that being an Oxford or Cambridge graduate means that you walk out of university and people and jobs and opportunities are throwing themselves at you. Uh, that I just don't feel is the reality of the situation. I had a conversation with one of my, um, Years, a few years ago as in one of the he's a guy who had studied at the same unit at Oxford as well that he was in the academic year above me and we were having this conversation about how much do you feel like being an Oxford grad has actually benefited you and his view was not at all like I've had to absolutely graft and it was interesting because there's now another contact that I have who studied the same course moons ago many moons ago and he said that in the first 10 years of graduation he doesn't feel like there will be any benefits but it's further on down the line when you realize that all these people that you studied with are now in the cabinet or, you know, doing this or head of that. So he feels like the dividends probably pay themselves much later on down the line. But it's, it's an interesting one. 
and you set up something called Open Palm, a society. What, what does it do? So Open Palm um, was very similar to 10,000 Black interns in terms of the overall aim. So what we did at Open Palm is, again, because I studied at a state comprehensive secondary school, I was born in Hackney, raised in, in Ilford, and at my school, I was not in any way the minority in terms of my race. It was a very, very mixed school, and that's what I was used to for my entire academic career. I now get to Oxford, I'm the only black person in my entire undergraduate degree across all three year groups, not even black woman, black person. I'm the only black person at my year group, uh, sorry, in my year group at my college at the time. Um, there was somebody else, but uh, that candidate unfortunately rusticated and didn't come back. So I was kind of left alone. Um, and it was quite difficult. It was a very difficult space for me to navigate uh, because of those things. And that's, Open Palm was born through that frustration and the, the aims and objectives of Open Palm were to increase the number or to increase the pipeline of black students from state comprehensive schools, taking up positions at Oxford, Cambridge and other Russell Group universities. And I launched that in my second year of my degree in 2015. And it had been going ever since. And I feel like Open Palm really was the kind of training ground for the work that I'm doing now with 10,000 Black interns. Did you get, and I mean, it still exists, so are you getting support from the universities in making this happen? The same sort of support that you found you're getting from all these, um, from all these companies? Yeah, so I found that, you know, um, after a few years of operation, that, that there was definitely support from, um, in particular, we partnered up with Oxford, with Oxford University. Um, so there was definitely support from the universities in that sense. Um, and it, to mention, to be fair, even with 10,000 black interns, we've partnered up with almost every university across the UK for this. So the Russell Group, the University Alliance, the University of London, like they are all on board and, all, and you know, helping us with this organization. So now more than ever, and more, now more than ever, you know, every institution, every organization really seems to be coming together to agree that the time is right for something like this. For sure. I, I would definitely say that prior to the unfortunate murder of George Floyd, these kind of conversations were much more difficult to have with people. There was a lot more convincing that needed to, to happen, you know, with meeting upon meeting, repeating the same statistics, trying to prove why this is needed, why this is necessary. But now I feel like we've almost skipped that part and it's kind of like, okay, what do we do now? Like, how do we deal with this? Which is refreshing, but unfortunate that it took the public murder of a black man for people to acknowledge that. Out of tragedy, good can come yep you know and it's it has happened um now we are going to go to questions from the audience and we've got quite a few okay how do you um this is from one of our researchers paris will at the inclusion initiative how do you source and reach eligible candidates for ten thousand black interns that might not hear about the initiative otherwise okay so that's a good question in terms of that so that goes back to some of the partnerships that we have so our eligibility criteria from the student perspective is you're black you're studying at a uk university uh, and that's across any year group of, of undergrad or postgraduate studies so you can be a second year on a medical course or you can be a third year on your phd um, or some or if you've graduated within the last three years so for applications this year graduates from 2018 onwards will also be eligible to apply to the program um, as well as post A level gap year students that are 18 plus with the intention to study within higher education. And of course, it makes sense to partner with the universities because that's where they all are. So um, we've got the universities on board, um, and in particular, uh, we're looking to reach out to all of the ACS presidents. And for those who don't know what that is, the ACS is the African and Caribbean Society, and every university has one. Oh, yeah. Me, particularly at Oxford, it was my home away from home. And I know that the black people congregate, they come together there and that's where they feel like they can kind of be themselves. Um, so yeah, we're partnering up with the ACSs, with the universities, NUS presidents as well, um, as well as other organizations, other, other cultural organizations that we, um, that we know kind of gather a lot, a lot of black people together. So that's how we'll be reaching out to them. And of course, social media and your usual channels, ads and all of the above. This is a question from Katerina Rudiger, who runs uh, the brokerage. She's the CEO of the brokerage, which helps um, underprivileged youth reach jobs in the city. Mm. Hi, Esther. Fantastic that you've had such a success with getting companies to take so many Black interns. Have you seen any of these companies thinking about changing their organizational practices, especially recruitment, 
as a result. Absolutely. And that has been one of the proudest things I think that has come out of the programme thus far, because we know that, you know, sometimes there are a lot of unnecessary barriers to entry for, for applicants to particular roles, you know, streams and streams of tests that are really nothing to do with the actual role that you'll then be taking up. And we've had this conversation with many firms who have numerical tests when they're not needed, situational judgment tests that don't really spit out the information you need to know whether or not this person is competent at the role. And many of them have come forward and said, look, we're, we're looking to strip that actually, because we're seeing that this is possibly one of the things that is creating that unnecessary barrier, because there's an access issue with that as well. I remember being at university and hearing um, some of my white counterparts saying, oh, my dad paid for um, an intensive McKinsey course and I was thinking, what are you talking? At this point in time, I didn't know what McKinsey was. This was in my first year. So I did a bit of Googling when I got back into my room, realized, that, okay, it's this, you know, this massive management consultancy firm. Everyone wants to work there. Great, fantastic. And then did some research into their tests and saw, you know, the kind of conversations surrounding that. And I just thought, wow, this person clearly has been having this conversation around the dining table for pretty much their entire life. So much so that their parents have funded a specific course for them to get into this specific institution. That's just not my reality as Esther born in Hackney, raised in Romford. That's not a thing for me. So there are access issues for, for some of these things as well that I think now more than ever, a lot of firms are becoming aware of because these tests do not tell you who is intelligent and who is not. These tests do not tell you who's gonna be competent at this role and who's not going to be competent at this role. The test tells you who has learnt how to do the test. <laughs> so yeah, we're definitely having these conversations and I'm pleased to say that a number of firms are walking in the direction of, of dropping that. Great, good news. Alex Garrick asks, you say that being able to be fully remote at work is very inclusive, but what do you feel the impact is on early years careers in this respect? Mm -hmm. Young people from low income families who perhaps don't have adequate space at home, et cetera, and to what extent are you needing to prep firms on this in relation to your interns? I think, Esther, among your answers, I'd love to hear, you know, these interns, where, where are they going to live um, when they come and do these internships in expensive London and so yeah. forth? Yeah, so it's so a good question. To answer um, the question about the impact of remote working, yeah, we absolutely acknowledge. I think in my case, I can say that for my situation, um, it's been inclusive for me and my my workforce, like my team, right? Like it's it's the best option for us right now. But I completely acknowledge that there are a number of issues that also need to be kind of tackled head on with regards to remote working, access to internet, access to devices that function well enough to be able to perform your role. And again, these are conversations that we're having um, with all of the firms. We'll actually be running a virtual internship training session for all of our participating firms in the coming weeks, whereby we'll be going over a number of these issues and putting forward some suggestions about how to combat this. And about your point, uh, your point with regards to early careers and general visibility, you know, because being in an office environment, you're seen by all, you're heard by all, if you're saying something at your desk or if you're, you know, posting someone about something, it's all ears, right? Everybody hears, but if you're, you know, sat in your bedroom, your teeth, your your, uh, your bed is in the background of the Zoom call and all of the above. These things can be potential barriers to the progression of somebody's career. And unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you see this, this is a direction that the world is moving in. So I think rather than saying we cannot, and I'm not saying that, the, I'm not saying that you're saying this, Alex, but rather than saying that we cannot or should not move towards remote working because of these issues, we should come up with ways to make sure that these are not barriers to people's career progressions and thinking about you know virtual sessions with managers where um, junior hires can post okay I've been doing xyz this week this is what I've achieved and just being much more intentional about keeping up with the progression of, of those juniors I think. Yeah. Um, let me just see from Odessa Hamilton who's another researcher in our program um, now, what is it? This is an incredible program. I think this may be too early, but let me just ask this incredible program and I applaud you for your vision and continued efforts. I wondered whether you have any statistics on those interns who are then offered subsequent opportunities. Is it too early? 
So yes, it's too early for that. However, we will be following up on that information, of course. But one thing to also mention is that it's not actually a prerequisite of the programme for firms to be able to offer full-time work at the end. Of course, that's a fantastic outcome for everybody involved, us, the intern and the firm from a long-term perspective. But where our, our eligibility criteria is for first years, second years, all of the above, that kind of uh, rollover into full-time work is specific to penultimate year students or graduates. So we have that functionality under the programme. It's not the biggest focus, but of course, it's something that we'll be tracking. Now, what uh, this is good and controversial, and I was dying to ask it, so I'm glad somebody else has. So what is your reaction to the government's race equality report? Are you disappointed with a lack of pushback from industry and third level institutions? That is, yeah. Sigh, it, a big sigh there. A big sigh, a big sigh. And what I will say is that I find it a waste of time engaging in gaslighting. It's not a useful exertion of energy or even conversation. I will leave it there. <laughs> this is a much more um, productive question. If you could pick a research project for the inclusion initiative to work on that would answer a question that is of interest to you and simultaneously improve access what would it be? I mean, it could involve working with firms, with schools. Sorry, if you can just repeat the okay. question, I can grasp that. So the inclusion initiative, we do research projects, which yep. get sponsored. And we would like to know, and this is from uh, Professor Grace Lorden, if you could pick a research project for us to work on that would possibly improve access as well on the back of it, what mm. project could you think of? Hmm. Or do you want to have a think about that? Yeah, I'll have to think about that one. I'll have to think about that. That's a good question. And come back to us. Yeah, definitely. I'm also open to, um, I know we've had a preliminary conversation about the LSE coming in and doing um, like an impact report or some impact research on, on the programme. That would be, that would be great. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> You, um, this is from Crystal. You spoke about the lack of diversity at Oxford. How can inclusion be improved in education at both higher education, even secondary and primary? Um, what I would say, and I can only speak of, you know, my personal experiences with those different levels of education. One thing that I faced at secondary school now, my secondary school was very supportive in terms of um, senior leaders of me applying to Oxford, for example. At the same time, there were some teachers, or should I say a teacher, who heavily discouraged me from doing that. Not to my face though, um, whilst I wasn't in the lesson, I was actually at the Cambridge Open Day. And at the time, um, this particular member of staff spoke to the class in my absence, asking where I was. They said, oh, she's gone to the Cambridge Open Day. And the teacher proceeded to basically host a conference for about 20 minutes as to why does Esther think that that's a university for her? Um, doesn't she realize that people that look and speak and talk like her um, don't uh, attend institutions like that? Does she realize how hard she has to work to get there? You know, that entire narrative. Um, and I think there is really something to be said about teacher training, particularly at state comprehensive schools, where you aren't really equipped to take up positions at Russell Group institutions a lot of the time, or, you know, Oxford and Cambridge. It's really an isolated process. Well, at least in my time, it was a very kind of, you had to pick who within the school you would even tell based on whether or not they could give you advice to encourage you to go there in the first place, you know? And I, I know that at your um, private schools, that, that that's, that's not gonna be the case for the students there. So inclusion in the academic space, definitely needs to um, needs to start with the training that teachers receive with regards to the messaging they give particular students with regards to the career paths that they try and funnel them through because I gave the example earlier on about my brothers and them being pushed into sports and music that's a form of that's a microaggression that's a form of racism you're saying that that's the we're only black people as a community are only um, valid when they're entertaining white people when we are giving you music that you can dance along to or when we're running on a track representing you for your entertainment it's it's ridiculous so yeah I would say uh, that's what I would say about the educational level 
you mentioned culture as a big thing that firms signal. Do you think black people self-select out of companies and firms that don't signal diversity? Yes, 100%. They absolutely do. And if they don't self-select themselves out before putting in the application, look at the turnover results, the staff turnover results of these different firms, and you will see that, you know, and I think more so with my generation and below, there is a huge no-nonsense attitude that we have. If a firm isn't going to give us what we need, we're much more selfish, I think, and rightly so. We're much more selfish and self-centered with our career approach than generations above us, I feel, have been. And we are looking for what the firm can give us. And if you can't give us what we want or need, we're going to go. We're going to I go think, to Esther, I would take issue with selfish. I mean, I think mm -hmm. older generations, in a way, didn't have a choice, a number mm -hmm. of them. However horrible it was, it was a job, it put food on the table, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but I think the great thing about your generation is if you can afford to go somewhere else, you know, you're going to walk. You're yeah. absolutely going to walk. And that's great that you have the, the will to do that. Mm -hmm. And that will help change things, although a bit slowly. Uh, we seem yeah. to be going rather slowly. This is a personal, a very, very personal question, which is I am in the world of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. at the moment and it's a new world which is going to have it's going to be massive amazing job opportunities and it's not just physicists and people understand quantum it's marketing executives it's ceos it's vice presidents business development all sorts and because it's early stages we're trying to develop a better culture than say big tech developed mm -hmm. and we're trying to get our head around how to make it a more ethical, a more inclusive industry. And it's a, it's a very difficult one when you sort of start almost from scratch, but already with the disadvantage that science, fewer women, fewer black people, et cetera, et cetera. And quantum physics, I mean, it scares the living Jesus out of everybody, doesn't it? Including yeah. me, okay? Yeah. So how can we do this? Oh, what a question, Karina. <laughs> what a question. I think in terms of understanding, um, it's impossible to understand what people want or need without speaking with them. So if you're looking for an environment that is inclusive towards women, inclusive towards people in the LGBTQ plus community, people in the black community, the Caribbean community, if you want to be more specific with these things, because there are nuances, right, that we need to actually acknowledge we, we already identified, I think, as a society, the uselessness of the term BAME and the, 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 how it's necessary to actually split that up, take the black out of BAME. I would take it a step further and within black, split that into the African experience and the Caribbean experience because there are nuances, big nuances that make a big difference. And if you actually look at the data of um, many firms or organizations or societies and governments, if, even if we look at it from an educational perspective, we'll see that black Caribbean boys, if you don't intervene in their circumstances, often from around year five, year six, it's often too late if you intervene any, any later than that. And you know that looks slightly differently when you're referring to African boys, for example. So that aside, I feel like it's impossible to make decisions on behalf of communities or people who identify in a particular way without having those conversations with them. So what I would encourage is to, is to sit down with these people and and ask them, <laughs> ask them directly. You know. Actual listening. Yeah, active listening. Yeah, active listening. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now I get, I always get a few questions that are sent to me via, um, here we go. Sure. Right. There's some really good questions. What would you say universities are missing by not having more students like you among their cohorts? <laughs> when you say that, when this person says like me, I'm assuming they mean more black students. Yeah. What are they missing? They're missing diverse perspectives. They're missing having um, a window into extremely rich cultures and differences in upbringing and all of the above. They're missing a great deal. And I know McKinsey uh, fairly recently did some research into the impact of diversity even in the workplace and how there is a correlation between high levels of diversity and high performance in terms of revenue of, of, of firms. So what is very clear is that 
whichever space you are in, the more diverse views, the, the, the larger the diversity of the views that you have coming to the table, the higher the likelihood of a good decision being made. Um, and within the student cohort as well, I mean, being on campus, it's peer-to-peer -peer learning a lot of the time. You're, it's two-way learning, even upwards and downwards learning relationships with lecturers and um, tutors and all of the above. And I feel sorry, I mean, again, this was my reality, but I really do feel sorry for students, black, white, Asian, whatever you are, in environments where there is such a huge majority of one particular demographic, it's just not enriching for anybody. It's not enriching for anybody. It's like looking to the left, seeing yourself in the mirror, looking to the right, seeing yourself in the mirror, front and back, it's the same thing. There is no difference in viewpoint, no difference in opinion. And I really did see this play out in my time in academia as well. Everybody thought the same and uh, brought very similar perspectives to the table. Um, yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Um, I like the idea of the mirror and just looking basically at yourself anyway. But there's also a great study that I just saw from Cass Business School. And they did a study of all the European banks and the extent of fraud within them. And the more diversity you had, both in the upper echelons and on the board, the less fraud you had. So they came up with this wonderful statistic about, you know, the world was saved $7 billion wow. by those firms that had more uh, diversity board yeah. and senior execs. So it's now, it gives me hope that for some people who are never gonna be convinced by doing what's right, that maybe these sort of constant statistics from Harvard Business School, McKinsey and the rest, mm -hmm. And the focus, perhaps more on the bottom line for those people, is going to have more of an effect than anything else. Do you yeah. agree or? I completely agree. I completely agree. And I guess it goes back to the point about more diversity leads to better decisions. And clearly, even with regards to decisions pertaining to the law <laughs> from the research that, that you're quoting. So, yeah, I completely agree. And, and I really encourage everybody listening, the firms that we all work for, to really consider these things because the benefits are not just optical, they're not just emotional, it's not just so that your employees feel better at work, it's not just so that from you know an aesthetic perspective more black people or more Asian people or more gay people want to work here because they see people that look like them or they've spoken to people that work here that look like them. These benefits go really into the fibre of the organisation. Um, so yeah, I really encourage people to, if you can send me the link to that research, that'd be great, I'd love to take a look at that. But yeah, happy I mean, to do that. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you one more question, which is very personal, actually. But <laughs> Shelley Archambault, the entrepreneur I spoke about yesterday, and Shelley Sandberg, who we all know of the um, Facebook um, chief operating officer, I think she is. Both she and Shelley both say the most important thing any woman can do in her career is to marry well. And they don't mean it in that old fashioned sense of marry a wealthy man. What they mean is marry somebody who will support you yeah. totally in your career aspirations. Yeah, Karina? You've done that? Tick, absolutely. <laughs> My husband is the best. Don't even get me started. Absolutely, he's the best, the most. Of if I said today, Karina, that I wanted to be a cheerleader in the NFL, he would be right behind me Let's do it, Esther. How do we get you there? Like anything, you know, he, he's fantastic. He's fantastic. And a very successful man himself. So, you know, he's, uh, he's great. We're going to end on that, um, <laughs> Esther. And thank you. Thank you hugely. And I hope he's managed to listen to this or he can listen to the recording if he's in a meeting or something. Yes, yeah, I'll send it to him for sure. Thank you so much for having me on. I've really enjoyed the conversation. A great pleasure and the Inclusion Initiative will be following up with you because we'll be following the career of your interns. I think that makes absolute sense to be able to analyze what works, where it works mm -hmm. and improve the program if we can help at all. Absolutely. 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 So to everybody listening, thank you very much. Uh, we've got no more time, but I hope Esther's drive and energy will lead to one million black interns. <laughs> Do tune in for our next Open Door, Open City webinar in June with Georgia Dawson, the first female senior partner of a Magic Circle law firm. And in fact, we've heard that there's another one in the offing at another firm. So the world is changing, even if it is a bit slowly. From all of us here at the Inclusion Initiative, thank you. 
and goodbye. <laughs>